Good morning, St. Michael's. My name is Chris Ishibashi, and I will be serving as your online chaplain today. I will be with you both Good on morning, Zoom and Facebook. My name is Chris Ishibashi. A I warm welcome to all of you, especially if you are visiting with us today, with you, you, either Facebook, in church or online. We are eager to greet you, to all of you especially and learn how God is at work in your life. So stay I tuned. We'll say more about that on. later in the service. To greet you. Now, as we prepare ourselves for worship, work in your life. take so a breath we'll and let yourself worship later. here in God's presence. Come, now as we prepare ourselves let us worship for God together. Take a breath.
Good morning. As we begin, I want to say a word of welcome and introduction. Bishop Marinez, who is Archbishop of the Anglican Church in Brazil, is here with us this Sunday. She is in town because yesterday we invested our new presiding bishop, the Most Reverend Sean Rowe. Bishop Marinez, wonderful to have you here. Blessed be God, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. There is one body and one spirit. One Lord, one faith, one baptism. The Lord be with you. Let us pray. Almighty and merciful God, it is only by your gift that your faithful people offer you true and laudable service. Grant that we may run without stumbling to obtain your heavenly promises. Through Jesus Christ our Lord, who lives and reigns with you and the Holy Spirit, one God, now and forever. Amen. Please be seated. A reading from the Book of Ruth. In the days when the judges ruled, there was a famine in the land, and a certain man of Bethlehem in Judah went to live in the country of Moab, he and his wife and two sons. The name of the man was Elimelech, and the name of his wife, Naomi, and the names of his two sons were Malon and Chilion. They were Ephrathites from Bethlehem in Judah. They went into the country of Moab and remained there, but Elimelech, the husband of Naomi, died, and she was left with her two sons. These took Moabab, Moabite wives, the name of the one was Orpah and the name of the other, Ruth. When they had lived there about ten years, both Malon and Chilion also died, so that the woman was left without her two sons and her husband. Then she started to return with her daughters-in-law from the country of Moab, for she, had for she had heard in the country of Moab that the Lord had considered his people and had given them, and given them food. So she set out from the place where she had been living, she and her two daughters-in-law, and they went on their way to go back to the land of Judah. But Naomi said to her two daughters-in-law, go back, each of you, to your mother's house, May the Lord deal kindly with you as you have dealt with the dead and with me. The Lord grant that you may find security, each of you in the house of your husband. Then she kissed them and they wept aloud. They said to her, No, we will return with you to your people. But Naomi said, Turn back, my daughters. Why will you go with me? Do I still have sons in my womb that they may become your husbands? Turn back, my daughters, go your way, for I am too old to have a husband, even if I thought there was hope for me, even if I should have a husband tonight and bear sons, would you then wait until they were grown? Would you then refrain from marrying? No, my daughters, it has been far more bitter for me than for you, because the hand of the Lord has turned against me. Then they wept aloud again. Orpah kissed her mother-in-law, but Ruth clung to her. So she said, See, your sister-in-law has gone back to her people and to her gods. Return after your sister-in-law. But Ruth said, Do not press me to leave you or to turn back from following you. Where you go, I will go. Where you lodge, I will lodge. Your people shall be my people and your God, my God. Where you die, I will die. There will I be buried. May the Lord do thus and so to me, and more as well, even if death parts me from you. When Naomi saw that she was determined to go with her, she said no more to her. The word of the Lord.
A reading from the letter to the Hebrews. When Christ came as a high priest of the good things that have come, then through the greater and perfect tent, not made with hands, that is, not of this creation, he entered once for all into the holy place, not with the blood of goats and calves, but with his own blood, thus obtaining eternal redemption. For if the blood of goats and bulls, with the sprinkling of the ashes of a heifer cow, sanctifies those who have been defiled so that their flesh is purified, how much more will the blood of Christ, who through the eternal spirit offered himself without blemish to God, purify our conscience from dead works to worship the living God. The word of the Lord. The Lord is one. You shall love the Lord your God with your whole heart, with all your soul and with all your mind and with all your strength. The second, this, you shall love your neighbor as yourself. There is no other commandment greater than these. Then the scribe said to him, You are right, teacher. You have, only true, you have truly said that he is one, and besides him there is no other. 
and to love him with all your heart and with all your understanding and with all your strength and to love one's neighbor as oneself. This is much more important than all the whole burnt offerings and sacrifices. <clears throat> when Jesus saw that he had answered wisely, he said to him, you are not far from the kingdom of God. After that, no one dared to ask him any question. The Gospel of our Lord. I would like to invite over to the font anybody who is small and needs to get a better view, whether that means you're a child or an adult, that is irrelevant. If you want a better view, come on over. The candidate for holy baptism will now be presented. I present Alice Leslie Borkmeyer to receive the sacrament of baptism. Will you be responsible for seeing that this child you present is brought up in the Christian faith and life? I will with God's help. And will you, by your prayers and witness, help this child to grow into the full stature of Christ? I will with God's help. And answering on her behalf, <laughs> she's answering too, <Yes. laughs> do you renounce Satan and all the spiritual forces of wickedness that rebel against God? I renounce them. Do you renounce the evil powers of this world which corrupt and destroy the creatures of God? I renounce them. Do you renounce all sinful desires that draw you from the love of God? I renounce them. Do you turn to Jesus Christ and accept him as your Savior? I do. Do you put your whole trust in his grace and love? I do. And do you promise to follow and obey him as your Lord? I do. And will all of you witnessing these vows do all in your power to support Alice in her life in Christ? We will. Let us then join with those who are committing themselves to Christ and renew our own baptismal covenant. Do you believe in God the Father? I believe in God the Father, Creator Do you believe in Jesus Christ, the Son of God? And born of the Virgin Mary, he suffered under Pontius Pilate was crucified, died, and was buried. He descended to the dead. On the third day, he rose again. He ascended into heaven and is seated at the right hand of the Father. He will come again to judge the living and the dead. Do you believe in God, the Holy Spirit? The Holy Catholic Church, the communion of saints, 
the forgiveness of sins, the resurrection of the body, and the life everlasting. Will you continue in the apostles' teaching and fellowship, in the breaking of bread and in the prayers? Will you persevere in resisting evil, and whenever you fall into sin, repent and return to the Lord? Will you proclaim by word and example the good news of God in Christ? Will you seek and serve Christ in all persons, loving your neighbor as yourself? And will you strive for justice and peace among all people and respect the dignity of every human being? Let us now pray for this person who is to receive the sacrament of new birth. Deliver her, O Lord, from the way of sin and death. Lord, hear our prayer. Open her heart to your grace and truth. Lord, hear our prayer. Fill her with your holy and life-giving spirit. Lord, hear our prayer. Keep her in the faith and communion of your holy church. Lord, hear our prayer. Teach her to love others in the power of the spirit. Lord, hear our prayer. Send her into the world in witness to your love. Lord, hear our prayer. Bring her to the fullness of your grace and glory. Lord, hear our prayer. Grant, O Lord, that all who are baptized into the death of Jesus Christ, your Son, may live in the power of his resurrection and look for him to come again in glory, who lives and reigns now and forever. Amen. Amen. The Lord be with you. Let us give thanks to the Lord our God. It is right to give our thanks and praise. We thank you, Almighty God, for the gift of water. Over it, the Holy Spirit moved in the beginning of creation. Through it, you led the children of Israel out of their bondage in Egypt into the land of promise. In it, your son, Jesus, received the baptism of John and was anointed by the Holy Spirit as the Messiah, the Christ, to lead us through his death and resurrection from the bondage of sin into everlasting life. We thank you, Father, for the water of baptism. In it, we are buried with Christ in his death. By it, we share in his resurrection. Through it, we are reborn by the Holy Spirit. Therefore, in joyful obedience to your Son, we bring into his fellowship those who come to him in faith, baptizing them in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit. Now sanctify this water, we pray you, by the power of your Holy Spirit, that those who here are cleansed from sin and born again may continue forever in the risen life of Jesus Christ our Savior. To him, to you, and to the Holy Spirit be all honor and glory, now and forever. Amen. We're happy with me. We'll see how this goes, huh? Okay. All right. Alice, I baptize you in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. Alice, you are sealed by the Holy Spirit in baptism and marked as Christ's own forever. Amen. Let us pray. Heavenly Father, we thank you that by water and the Holy Spirit, you have bestowed upon this your servant the forgiveness of sin and have raised her to the new life of grace. 
Sustain her, O Lord, in your Holy Spirit. Give her an inquiring and discerning heart, the courage to will and to persevere, a spirit to know and to love you, and the gift of joy and wonder in all your works. Amen. Let us welcome the newly baptized. We receive you into the household of God, confess the faith of Christ crucified, proclaim his resurrection, and share with us in his eternal priesthood. And we always add a little extra water for the rest of us to remember the baptism of our Lord and new life that is promised to all of us. And we start with you guys. <laughs> May the peace of Christ be always with you. Well done. May the words of my mouth and the meditation of my soul find favor in your sight, Lord God. I was a Sunday school teacher for many years. Every Sunday, I tried to brighten my young and eager students with words that they would remember and embrace as we would discuss that day's gospel. I'd learned from many of my teachers who were mentors and friends who had lifted me up in my young ears, and I wanted to make sure that I gave that to the children in my class. Each class, I would begin with an exuberant, this is my favorite sermon. Well, any of us who have been teachers or have been around young people, 
you know you always have at least one in your class, one of those who are going to test the waters in their whimsical curiosity and, develop, and developmentally appropriate mischievous selves. They always had that one more question, that one more statement meant to kind of shake you up. One Sunday, I was about to declare my usual, my usual statement. This little darling blurted out, oh, come on, Miss Calendar, we know this is your favorite scripture. <laughs> well, actually, today, this is one of my favorite scriptures. And it's not lost on me that my first gospel, my first sermon on the gospel is one that I truly love, that is here at all, that here at St. Michael's on All Saints Day on this glorious Sunday. So I hope that my words indeed you are able to embrace as I give them from my heart. Every time I read the Gospel of Mark, I am reminded about those special teachers in my life, those that moved me and those that indeed made an impact on me. You see, because of the four Gospels, Mark gives us Jesus as indeed the rabbi and teacher. It is one of the shortest Gospels, I believe, to keep focused and to the point and to the God-given syllabus that Jesus is here to carry out in a very short time. And more importantly, to show us in action what we are supposed to do to go out and build a beloved community that God dreamed of when he created the heavens and earth. In Mark, we meet the teacher, the rabbi, meeting the learned and unlearned in an outdoor classroom where all that Jesus said is accessible to the marginalized and to the mighty, to the meek and to the powerful, to the humble and to the proud, all made in God's image, regardless of how they see themselves or how others have defined them. Jesus speaks and shows the love of God with every word he speaks. And the crowds begin to gather everywhere this man shows up. And in these crowds, they are those that embrace and hold on to every word he says. And those are those that are rattled by this radical words and revolutionary actions that threaten to bring down the structures of the mighty Roman Empire. Here in this passage, Jesus is about a week before he is crucified, buried, and as we know again, will rise again in three days. The crowds have been gathering to see this man who God is well pleased. Led by those who doubt him, God, Jesus is bombarded by questions to trip him up, to rattle him, to have him make a misstep. But Jesus answers each question without fear or hesitation as he was sent here to do. And then as we read today, at one point a scribe approaches Jesus, who not only heard the questions from his adversaries, but also is hearing the disputes among the crowd. I love it. I love it how Mark gives us this side of Jesus, the teacher. In just a few words, you can feel his admiration for Jesus, asking him a question, not only for himself, but for those he is writing down to share with others. Which commandment is first of all, he asks, and Jesus answers as Moses did many, many years before. He says, hear, O Israel. The Lord our God, the Lord is one. Love the Lord your God with your whole heart and with your whole soul and with all your mind and all your strength. The second is this, love your neighbor as yourself. There is no commandment greater than these. 
The scribe expresses his excitement. Hearing those words as a descendant of Moses, he is well familiar of them, who on the mount received and engraved tablets of the first 10 commandments and of the 613 that would follow, these 10, these two were spoken by God and now Jesus. The scribe lets Jesus know, man, you got it. You're right. That's on time. And this is when I love Jesus. He says to the young man, you're not far from the kingdom. Jesus is letting him know you're not there yet because you merely understand, embrace, or even love God. The journey is not yet over. To love the Lord your God with all your heart and with all your soul and with all your mind and all your strength. But you have a ways yet to go. You need to keep on that path. And so like those times and those famous family road trips when the kids are in the backseat saying, Daddy, are we there yet? Are we there yet? Are we there yet? And the parents say, no, not quite. We're not quite there. We have more to go. You see, God knew this when he created us, to be in this world, to walk a path that he created. But in our humanness, we get things wrong. We sort of reconfigure God's GPS and get off course. Let's face it. Every morning when I wake up and say, God, thank you for this new day, I'm picking up a very hard task. There is nothing more difficult that any of us will do than to follow God, to love God, and to follow Jesus even to the cross. And we keep in our innocence, in our appropriateness, in our mischievous, in all those behaviors and all those things and all those temptations, we sometimes fall short of God's dream. The writer Verna Dozier writes very beautifully about the dream of God and how God, when he created us, gave us everything we need, everything we need to celebrate this world and those who live in it. But somehow we get it twisted and we get tired and we get tempted and we lose our way. And at the time when this gospel was written, there was turmoil in the land as there is now. The world has never quite gotten it right. But as children of God, we know what we are supposed to do because it is demonstrated to us throughout the Bible. God is continuously reminding us, whatever you do, you will not be away from me. I will find you, I will lift you up, and I will put you back in track because I know what's in your heart because I put it there. Sometimes I wonder what would the world look like if we really held on to God's love and loved our neighbors as ourselves? What kind of world would we be creating for our children, leaving them as our descendants? We have seen throughout the collective out, we have seen throughout our collective history from time to time things when we didn't quite get right. What happens when our worship services are completed? and our fellowship is cleared away. And we walk out those doors, leaving God's love in the seats where we sat so comfortably. This is a place where we learn, read, and talk of God's love. But in the world, we are often distracted. And we need to practice what we are learning, what we are reading, what we are hearing, what we are singing out in the real world, in the gatherings, in the disputes, in those uneasy times. We learn as we learn from our teacher. Years ago when I was in high school, I had such a teacher. He was a real character, he was our drama teacher. And every year he would have a course that was kind of out of the books and you know, out of the bag and always something a little different. One year he did a course on monarchy, leadership, dictatorship. It was a fabulous course that there weren't so much text. We would go to museums and we would go to concerts and we would see movies about different leaders from as far back as Caesar to present time. When we came to the section on one of the most talked about and studied dictators, 
Hitler, it was a very difficult section. I was about 17, 18, and we had to watch a movie that celebrated, celebrated Hitler's reign. And it was horrific. I will spare you the details. It was absolutely horrifying. And as these black and white images kept flashing in front of me, at one point I had to get up and I had to ask my teacher, I said, is it okay if I leave? I really cannot watch any more of this because I had never experienced so much evil. And he allowed me to go home. I could not get home quick enough to my, to my teenage room and blast Elton John's Captain Fantastic until everything else was just wiped away. On my way home on the subway, a young man came on the train. He was dressed with this European flair in this beautiful navy blue suit, white shirt, lapel, uh, a lapel in his pocket, this, this leather satchel. He had grayish black hair curled slightly, pulled back, combed back, curled slightly under his ear. He was dressed to the nines. At one point, he pulled out a newspaper, and he went to, this is when the subway still had straps. When he went to hold the strap, the first thing I noticed was a beautiful monogram cuff, a lapis cuffling. And as he turned his hand there on his wrist, I could see the Holocaust symbol. I was horrified. I had never been in that kind of space before. And my unease inside just grew and grew until I burst out into tears, tears that would not stop. He kept looking at me and watching me, and finally he took his handkerchief out and gave it to me and said, it's all right, that you did nothing. You did nothing. And then I looked at him again, and I said, my God, how old are you, about four or five? He said, I was seven. And he went on to say how his family was brought to the concentration camp, how his father didn't make it out, his mother and three sisters made it out, and how they made it eventually through Europe and eventually to America, and how he has started this beautiful life, family, children, but never forgetting. And at one point, as I kept crying, I said, I'm so sorry, I'm so sorry. I said, how did you survive? How did you survive all of this? And he said, with God's love. And I looked at him at, you know, 17, I said, what? He said, God's love. To love God and for us to love one another. These are some times we're living in. We know our world is divided. We see it every day. We hear it every day. This is a time more than ever to come together in prayer, in prayer in reminding us that loving God, and I quote Bishop Curry, who talked about God's love so often, it is beyond religion, it is beyond church, it is beyond these doors. When I find myself spiritually uneasy or, 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 or not quite standing up straight, I pull out the very words we read today in the baptismal covenant to get myself standing right. It is words, it's call to action, do you believe? Do you believe? And if you believe these things, then we will change the world in which we live. It's not enough to speak the word. It is to live the word. As all the saints who have come before us, of all the saints that survived the storms and broke the chains of bondage and dealt with things that none of us could ever imagine but survived, all the saints, as we are anointed today in our baptism, we remember them and we too, saints of today, keep marching on to make a difference, to lift the fallen, to sick the lost, to embrace God as his beloved son, who was saved, who saved us all by the glory of his resurrection. Yesterday, I had the privilege of being part of the St. Michael's kitchen. We served at least three times around the block, grateful, humble, the meek, the marginalized, food. It was a tale of two cities, a tale of two cities, on one hand being among the people who need what we have to offer, 
among some people, not all, but some people walked by not very pleased that they were there. A couple people stopped and said hello, but there were a lot, there were a few people who, as I said, were not too pleased. There were a lot of disputes among them. There was one woman who was with her two children, and I kind of was watching, you know, the kid, her little daughter was about maybe six or seven, skipping along. Mother kept telling her to walk straight, do this, do that, little baby in the carriage. As they approached on 99th and Amsterdam, the mother said to the little girl, don't look. Don't look. Now, you know what the little kid did. Of course, she looked. At one point, the mother said, don't look. I told you, don't look. The light turned red. The mother was taking care of the little one. The little girl, at one point, kept looking over her shoulder. At one point, our eyes caught one another. And I smiled gently at her. Her eyes opened wide, and she smiled. And she looked again. I gave her a little thumbs up. I believe. I believe in God's love with all my heart, with all my mind, with everything that I have, that that little girl will make a difference in this world. Because she's not afraid to look at the cracks. She's not afraid to look at the law. She's not afraid to look at the hunger without eyes of love and understanding, and that's what God is about. So as we take this feast that God has set for us today, let's take it, let's be fed by the love of Jesus, the blood, body of Jesus, and then go out into the world and come better next Sunday than we came today. Amen. Amen. And now, my friends, walk in love as Christ loved us and gave himself for us, an offering and a sacrifice for all.
As we continue to celebrate the feasts of all saints and all souls, we remember in our daily worship, beloved of our parish community who have died. I will name the names for today. We remember Cookie Laplace, Jeff Brody, Kiara Garthwaite, John Garthwaite, Sylvia Clayman, Fred Pfeiffer, Simon Pritchard, Judith Pritchard, George Clayman, Saul Schiffman, Charlotte Patton, Yvonne Rebecca Regisford, Henry and Elvira Collins, Marilyn and Lakeisha Plowden, Anne Riley Jenkins, and the Reverend Richard Alton. May the souls of all the faithful departed rest in peace and rise in glory. The Lord be with you. Lift up your hearts. Let us give thanks to the Lord our God. We praise you and we bless you, holy and gracious God, source of life abundant. From before time, you made ready the creation. Your spirit moved over the deep and brought all things into being. Sun, moon, and stars, earth, winds, and waters, and every living thing. You made us in your image and, caught and taught us to walk in your ways. But we rebelled against you and wandered far away. And yet as a mother cares for her children, you would not forget us. Time and again, you called us to live in the fullness of your love. And so this day, we join with saints and angels in the chorus of praise that rings through eternity, lifting our voices to magnify you as we sing. And praise to you, holy and living God, to deliver us from the power of sin and death, and to reveal the riches of your grace, you look with favor upon Mary, your willing servant, that she might conceive and bear a son, Jesus, the holy child of God. Living among us, Jesus loved us. He broke bread with outcasts and sinners, healed the sick, and proclaimed good news to the poor. He yearned to draw all the world to himself, yet we were heedless of his call to walk in love. Then the time came for him to complete upon the cross the sacrifice of his life and to be glorified by you. On the night before he died for us, Jesus was at table with his friends. He took bread, gave thanks to you, broke it and gave it to them, and said, Take, eat, this is my body which is given for you. Do this for the remembrance of me. As supper was ending, Jesus took the cup of wine. Again, he gave thanks to you, gave it to them, and said, drink this, all of you. This is my blood of the new covenant, which is poured out for you and for all for the forgiveness of sins. Whenever you drink it, do this for the remembrance of me. Now gathered at your table, O God of all creation, and remembering Christ crucified and risen, who was and is and is to come, we offer to you our gifts of bread and wine and ourselves a living sacrifice. Pour out your spirit upon these gifts that they may be the body and blood of Christ. Breathe your spirit over the whole earth and make us your new creation, the body of Christ given for the world you have made. In the fullness of time, bring us with St. Michael, St. Jude, and all your saints from every tribe and language and people and nation to feast at the banquet prepared from the foundation of the world. 
through Christ and with Christ and in Christ, in the unity of the Holy Spirit, to you be honor, glory, and praise forever and ever. Amen. As our Savior Christ has taught us, we now pray. This is God's table, and all of us are invited guests. Wherever you are today on your journey, you are welcome to come and to receive. We will have the gifts of bread and wine here at the high altar, and also at the St. Jude's altar at the entrance of the church, and the ministry of the laying on of hands for healing in the side chapel. These are the gifts of God for the people of God.
as you're comfortable, and we will conclude with our post-communion prayer. Let us pray. Eternal God, you have graciously accepted us as living members of our Savior, Jesus Christ, and you have fed us with spiritual food in the sacrament of his body and blood. Send us now into the world in peace and grant us strength and courage to love and serve you with gladness and singleness of heart through Christ our Savior. Amen. Please be seated. <laughs> Good morning. And happy All Saints Sunday, happy Baptism Day to Alice, happy Marathon Sunday to those of our parishioners who are running. It is a joyful day and a joyful celebration, and again, so wonderful to have Bishop Marinez here with us this day. We have um, just a couple of announcements to make, and then we get to hear our stewardship testimony from Patrick Littell. Um, but just a couple of things over the next few days, as we prepare for the election, it is important that we stay as deeply rooted in prayer as we are able. And to encourage that, here at church tomorrow night from 6 to 9 o'clock, there is an election eve vigil. It will happen in person and online. You can come for part of it or for all of it. There will be music, prayers, scripture. So from 6 to 9 here in the church, on Tuesday, Election Day, we'll be saying evening prayer together here in church at 6 o'clock. And then on Wednesday, we invite you to join us gathering with our diocese in an interfaith vigil on the steps of the cathedral, which begins at 7 o'clock. So please take part in some of those and do your own work to be prayerful and grounded in your faith today and through this coming week. Um, to help us do that, our own Rick Hamlin is leading us in a forum today following the service beginning at about 11.30 on the topic of love your enemies. So he'll be doing that in the parish house reception room. You can, lead to, you can get to that through the doors on your right, um, and that will be happening in person only, not online. I think that's all the announcements I have. Patrick, would you come up and give us a word? As you know, this is during our stewardship pledge drive. We have different members of our community speak to us about giving and about what St. Michael's is about for them and their lives. So we have our cake baker, Patrick, to speak. <laughs> Good morning, everybody. Good morning. Uh, thank you for asking me to speak, Mother Kate. Welcome, Bishop. This is our church. This is off script. But Alice, where are you? Welcome, honey. We love you. Um, I come here every Sunday. I've got to focus on what I wrote, so I don't go off script too much. I am a churched Christian. I was raised in the church every Sunday. My parents instilled in us at an early age the church was like the sun and the moon. It was part of the fabric of our lives. Being a Christian meant that Sunday mornings were devoted to attending Mass. Nothing came before the Lord, not soccer, not hockey practice, not breakfast at the diner, nothing. And in my senior years, that truth remains. Sunday morning is my favorite part of the week. I do my regular chores and time allowing bake a tea cake for our coffee hour. And once a month, I write a check for my pledge. When I do that, I pray and offer thanksgiving to our Father for my ability to give. I can recall my father telling me as a young adult that there were Sundays that my parents placed their last dollars in the collection plate. And I'm one of eight. My father did not share this with me to brag about his selflessness but to share with me just how important it is to fund the works of our church. That chat has remained with me my whole adult life and has impacted me in the best possible way. 
Have you ever worried about how you are going to pay the bills coming in? I have. Uh, so I know how challenging balancing a budget can be, especially when dollars are tight. In the maturity of my years, I know that there will be years of bounty and years of concern. In the end, however, placing my trust in God has always led me to financially support the church. Here are some reasons I support St. Michael's. I'm sure, I'm sure you share them with me. Every Sunday, I am greeted by Lowell and Sally in the narthex. Their warm smiles make me feel so welcome. Omar is quietly walking around, making sure that everything is in place for the Eucharist. I sit down and listen to the choir warm up. Laura Inman and John Cantrell's leadership add so much to our worship, especially today. Wow. I love hearing the organ shake the terrazzo floor under our feet as Aletheia Teague plays, and I have been known to sing too loudly because I am so moved by their gifts. I wait for the loving and holy words of Mother Kate and our other leadership to help direct my thoughts and actions for the coming week. I need the help to live a Christian life in the city. And today, I am very thankful for the words of Deacon Marsha. Yes, we still have a way to go. Our growth in our faith never ends. As we age, we have new insight to the Gospels. That is another reason to attend our liturgy. My parents gave me two foundations for my faith, which guide me every day. The gift of prayer and the gift of serving others. St. Michael's fills me with hope of love and faith. Seeing you all and worshiping with you every week is such a blessing for me. How many programs we have to help us and help our neighbors. Doors wide open, Saturday kitchen, Monday night tutoring, youth retreat, our annual coat drive, our church fellowships, our prayer warriors, I expect to come to the liturgy on Sunday and have the doors open. I expect the lights to be on. I expect the building to be lit and warm. And on the days of the week when I am not here, I expect our programs that support our journey in faith and supply the needs of our neighbors to go on with the blessing of our Father in heaven. You know, as I know, that this is a beautiful and loving community, and it exists because of our commitment to love, to, to commitment to God and to each other. So today I speak of time, talent, and treasure with the focus on your generosity and financial commitment to St. Michael's. When I wrote my check this morning, I was so thankful to do so, to support this magnificent Christian family, which you are to me and I ask you to be as generous as you can. We have many programs that need supporting, including a new scholarship fund um, and doors wide open. So during this month of pledge, may you promise as I have to support our beautiful parish and the works we do for our neighbors. God bless you and have a great week. Would you all please stand, and Bishop, will you give us your blessing? Now we will receive the blessing in Portuguese. May the blessing of God remain with us, our families, our homes. Que o amor de Deus nos una, a alegria de Deus nos inspire. Paz de Deus nos envolva, a coragem de Deus nos sustente e a bênção de Deus onipotente, Pai, Filho e Espírito Santo, seja conosco e conosco habite eternamente. Amém. Amém.
let us go forth in the name of the Lord. Hallelujah, hallelujah. Thanks be to God.